Um, in the hymn by John Henry Newman, Firmly I Believe and Truly, the following verse occurs. And I hold in veneration for the love of him alone, Holy Church as his creation and her teachings as his own. We used to have great fun with this verse at Theological College, and we used to tease the Anglo-Catholics by asking them whether they believed this, and if so, whether they accepted the infallibility of the Pope, the Immaculate Conception, and the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. However, the verse expresses a problem for the Church of England just as much as for the Church of Rome. You will remember that last week I described how Bishop Paget of Oxford declined to accept William Temple for ordination because Temple could only very tentatively accept the virgin birth. What worried Paget was that he might ordain someone who would be authorised to teach in the name of the church a doctrine of what he was not completely sure. I often used to hear the same argument when I was training for ordination. The argument went that an ordained priest should teach the faith of the church and keep any private reservations to himself. I found that view intolerable then, and I find it intolerable today. Underlying this argument was the following view of tradition. Jesus entrusted the Christian faith to the first disciples. They passed it on to their successors, and they passed it on to further successors, so that the teaching of the church today is guaranteed by this succession of teaching. A further point is, that this is also guaranteed by the so-called apostolic succession of bishops, whose historic task it is to teach and preserve the faith. Now, there is an element of truth in this. In the first two centuries of the existence of the church, the gospel was threatened from several types of false teaching. One of them denied that Jesus had been truly human, while another denied that he had been truly God. In addition, there were groups represented by the so-called Gospel of Thomas and the so-called Gospel of Mary, which claimed to preserve secret teachings of Jesus, which he had given to followers such as Thomas or Mary Magdalene. There is no doubt that the idea of a chain of teachers transmitting the authentic gospel helped to preserve the early church from being corrupted or subverted by these teachings. On the other hand, it was not quite as straightforward as this. It is clear from the letters of Paul to the Galatians and the Corinthians that there were people in the Jerusalem church who disputed Paul's right to preach the gospel and who claimed that his version of Christianity was false. We can only be grateful that Paul and the churches founded by him were able to resist these accusations as well as the erroneous teachings about Jesus that abounded in the days of the early church. However, the fact that some form of tradition in the early church saved it from corruption by false teachings should not commit us to the view of tradition that is implied in the verse from the hymn that I quoted at the beginning. Tradition is not an adding on process by which you simply add on to what you already have. Tradition, in the Christian sense, must be a continual critical engagement 
with what has been passed down in the light of new knowledge and new thinking. It was critical engagement with tradition that led St Norbert to found the order of canons that ministered here in the Abbey for 350 years. And it was critical engagement which made Martin Luther challenge the church of his day and bring about the Reformation. In this evening's lecture, I shall try to describe some of the ways in which a broad church today can understand and use tradition. I shall begin by speaking of the importance of studying the history of tradition. For many years I taught a course in Sheffield entitled The Use of the Bible in Social and Moral Questions. I approached the subject historically by showing how the Bible had been used in previous centuries and in different Christian traditions. For example, on the matter of the divorce and remarriage of people, something which the Church of England has only very recently and very grudgingly come to accept, I was able to point out for, that for the great reformers, Luther and Calvin, whose commitment to the Bible could not be questioned, divorce and remarriage was certainly allowable in some cases. This was also the view of the great Puritan scholar Richard Baxter. Another interesting topic was whether the Bible teaches that if Christians are going to eat meat, it should be kosher or halal meat. I declare an interest here, I'm a vegetarian. Not only is it clearly taught in Genesis 9-4 that meat should not be eaten with the blood, the law is restated in Leviticus 17.12 and in Acts 15 at the Council of Jerusalem, it is decided that non-Jews who become Christians should observe that part of the Mosaic law that prohibits the eating of blood. It could therefore be claimed, as some Christian writers have done in the past, that the prohibition against eating blood has the highest authority, being commanded by God to Noah, reaffirmed by Moses, and renewed by the apostles acting under the guidance and instruction of the Holy Spirit. Yet I have never met any Christians today, including the strictest Bible-believing Christians, who were even aware of the matter, let alone prepared to take it seriously. I found that approaching things historically in this way enabled students to engage critically with tradition in a way that did not immediately threaten their own positions, but which led them to reconsider why it was that they accepted the views that they did. Another way of engaging critically with tradition is to study the history of biblical interpretation. When this is done, it becomes clear that the interpretation of the Bible has always been critical in the sense that interpreters have applied to the text their knowledge of science and of human growth and development and the evidence of other passages in the Bible. As I mentioned in the discussion two weeks ago, the Hebrew text of 1 Samuel 13, 1 states that Saul was one year old when he began to reign. The text is obviously corrupt, but this is what has been preserved as the canonical text. That Saul was aged one year when he began to reign is obviously impossible from the point of view of human growth and development, and also because in the following chapter, Saul is said to have a son, Jonathan, who is a young man, which probably means that he was at least 14 years old. As far as I am aware, no attempt has ever been made to argue 
that the text must be accepted as it stands as true. Rather, various attempts have been made to get round the difficulty. Early Christian commentators, following Jewish scholars, said that it meant that Saul was as innocent as a child aged one year old when he began his reign. Another ancient Jewish solution, followed by the authorised version of the Bible, was to mistranslate the Hebrew to mean that God, that Saul reigned one year before he summoned all Israel to gather before him. We also mentioned in discussion two weeks ago Augustine's great work, The City of God, written early in the fifth century, in which Augustine dealt with a number of difficulties in the opening chapters of Genesis, such as why light is created on the first day, but the sun and moon are not created until the fourth day. What sort of light was it that God created on the first day? Again, were the long years lived by people in Genesis chapter 5, running in some cases to over 900 years, the same length as years that we experience, or were they different? In the 12th century, the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides argued that all the prophecies and miracles in the Old Testament occurred in visions to those who were involved. He based this on Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, which says that God spoke to Abraham in a vision. And for Maimonides, this statement controlled all other passages in the Old Testament that recorded prophecies and miracles. They all occurred in visions, not in the normal world of experience, and therefore they did not violate any scientific laws. I could give many other illustrations to show that it was not in the 19th century that people first began to have difficulties about miraculous and other stories in the Bible, but that this had been the case from the very earliest days of biblical interpretation. Knowing this does not, of course, necessarily help us to interpret the difficult passages, but it stops us from feeling guilty about reading the biblical text critically and honestly. Last week I was speaking of William Temple's difficulties with the virgin birth, and it is not widely known that in 1938 the Church of England published a report entitled Doctrine in the Church of England, the report of a commission that had been chaired by Archbishop Temple in which it was clearly stated and acknowledged that some members of the Commission felt that the doctrine of the virgin birth diminished the humanity of Jesus and impaired his complete identification with the human race. Although this was a minority view among members of the Commission, the report made it clear that to be uncertain about the virgin birth did not mean that a person did not accept the full divinity of Christ. Indeed, it could be argued that denying the virgin birth made the claim that God was in Christ even more wonderful than if Jesus had had a miraculous birth. It was ignorance of this report that led to assertions that people should not be ordained if they could not accept the virgin birth. Now, what I've said so far may seem to have been negative, but I have not intended it to be so. We are told in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 32, that the truth will make us free. And I have known many students to be liberated by gaining a historical perspective on the history of biblical interpretation and its use in social and moral questions. 
and by discovering that if they had difficulties with some details of miracles, they were by no means the first to do so. It is tragic when Christians find themselves in churches where tradition is used and understood in such a way as to make members feel that they cannot be honest with themselves and that they must leave their brains and critical faculties behind at the church door when they enter the church building. It should be added <coughs> that, crit <coughs> me. <coughs> that critical engagement with the history of tradition was characteristic of the broad churchmen of the 19th century. Coleridge, for example, looked back to the work of the Anglican Cambridge Platonists of the 17th century and also engaged with the writings of Bishop Jeremy Taylor and Archbishop Robert Layton. The next part of tradition that I want to discuss is that of church hymns. In the Lutheran tradition, of course, these play an enormous role, especially in the way that the tunes of the hymns were used by J.S. Bach in his Preludes and Cantatas. Not only Luther himself, but other great hymn writers adorn this tradition, including Paul Gerhardt in the 17th century and Jochen Klepper in the 20th century, who took his own life together with those of his Jewish wife and younger daughter to save them from being taken to Nazi death camps. Some of the best German hymns have been translated into English, such as, Now thank we all our God, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation, and all my hope on God is founded. And it is not widely known that John Wesley translated a number of German hymns for use in his own work. In the English-speaking tradition of hymn writing, two great representatives are Isaac Watts and Charles Wesley, and their importance lies in their marvellous ability to state Christian belief profoundly in poetic language. Take, for example, the final verse of Wesley's well-known hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. You'll remember that it goes as follows. Finish, then, thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. Some of the language comes straight from the Bible, changed from glory into glory, comes from 2 Corinthians 3.18, while casting crowns comes from the great vision of the worship of heaven in Revelation 4.10. The idea of the new creation comes from 2 Corinthians 5.17. The passage that says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature or new creation. These images are then combined together in order to produce profound theology. The person who is grasped by and responds to divine love is a new creation. But this cannot be a completed work in this world. It can only be a work in progress, and the task of making the believer pure and spotless is achieved as he or she gazes upon the face of Christ. But this is not a work in progress whose completion will benefit only the individual concerned. Its completion will sum up 
the great universal salvation accomplished in Christ. All these profound thoughts are expressed in eight lines of simple poetry. In the well-known Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, come the following lines. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Four lines of poetry express the mystery of the incarnation and the humanity and divinity of Christ. A remarkable hymn by Charles Wesley, which I have never heard sung in an Anglican church, has the following first verse. Let earth and heaven combine, angels and men agree, to praise in songs divine the incarnate deity, our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. The second verse is just as remarkable. He laid his glory by, he wrapped him in our clay. Unmarked by human eye, the latent Godhead lay. Infant of days, he here became and bore the mild Emmanuel's name. Almost certainly the best-known hymn of Isaac Watts is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, which is a marvellous version of Paul's exclamation in Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Other well-known hymns by Watts include Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne, and Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. The importance of hymns in enabling us not only to worship, but also to form and inform the theology by which we live cannot be underestimated. And the fact that schools no longer have formal acts of worship in which these hymns are used is not only a matter of great regret, but an actual and potent threat to the knowledge and practice of Christianity in this country. I grew up in a family that had little or no contact with the church or Christianity, but I can still remember learning the hymn Jesus shall reign at primary school, and being thrilled by it. And I want to say something about the importance of sermons as part of tradition. Several years before I retired from Sheffield University, I taught a course entitled The Use of the Bible in Preaching. As far as I am aware, this was unique in the British university system, and yet the use of the Bible in preaching must far exceed any other use when you consider the number of sermons preached every Sunday and that this has been going on for 2,000 years in the universal church. Of course, only the best sermons get published, which is just as well. I'm hoping that the Abbey might publish some of mine. <laughs> The broad Anglicans of the 19th century are well represented here. In the first lecture, I quoted from several of the remarkable sermons by F. W. Robertson of Brighton. I also have on my bookshelves many volumes of sermons by F. D. Morris, and Charles Kingsley similarly published sets of sermons. Much can be learned from these, not only about the broad church movement, but about Christian theology in a profound way. The 20th century also produced its great preachers and their published sermons. I was greatly helped in my early steps in Christian faith by the sermons of the Methodist preacher, Leslie Weatherhead, 
And I was also able to hear him preach at the city temple in London on several occasions. Two things impressed me deeply about Weatherhead's preaching. First of all, it was absolutely honest. If there were difficulties in the text or the doctrine that he was expounding, he faced and recognised them head on. This was most encouraging to someone like myself with an exceedingly critical and questioning mind and surrounded by people who told me that I must teach what the church believed, whatever my own mental reservations might be. Secondly, Weather had made it clear to his listeners that he was a committed disciple of Jesus Christ and that his aim in preaching was to help others in their discipleship. This combination of honesty and positive preaching was an important part of my own formation. This observation leads me to make what I think is the most important point in this evening's lecture. It is that tradition, however we understand it, should be liberating and not imprisoning. What I have called the add-on theory of tradition, something that has to be maintained by the church at all costs and which has to be accepted by Christians whether they can do so honestly or not, is definitely not liberating. Critical engagement with the past, with the way that the Bible has been used, or with the history of theology, is liberating. It sees tradition not in terms of believing about or believing that, but in terms of believing in the God who in Jesus Christ brings hope and life. In other words, tradition must be a means to an end, the end being living faith in God. It must not be an end in itself. Other great preachers of the 20th century who could be mentioned here include the Lutheran preacher Helmut Thielicke, who was a member of the Confessing Church in Germany, the church that actively opposed Hitler, and who preached to large crowds in Hamburg in the closing days of the war and in the difficult days of the post-war period in Germany. His sermons on the parables of Jesus translated into English under the title The Waiting Father are full of great insights. Another German Lutheran who had to take refuge in the United States and who preached remarkable sermons was Paul Tillich. Two fine collections go under the arresting titles The Shaking of the Foundations and the eternal now. The last aspect of tradition that I want to talk about in this evening's lecture is collections of prayers. It is arguable that I ought also to talk about worship as part of tradition, but that would make this lecture too long. And my text here says, I shall say something about worship in the final lecture next week. I have to confess that having written it, I haven't done so. But uh, we can't be perfect all the time. Like collections of sermons at their best, collected prayers at their best contain the accumulated wisdom and experience of people's encounter with God over many generations. Although they can be no substitute for our own prayers, they can deepen our faith and help us feel that we are part of a great tradition stretching back over centuries of people who have trusted in God and were not disappointed. Many years ago, I bought at a church jumble sale an original 1936 edition of the BBC prayer book used in connection with the daily service and entitled New Every Morning. I still use this almost every day as the basis for my own prayers. One of my favourites from this collection 
is one that we used when the Abbey was recently rededicated by the Archbishop of York. It goes as follows. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favourably on thy whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of thy perpetual providence, carry out the work of man's salvation. And let the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, that those which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin, even through our Lord Jesus Christ. It may be objected to what I have said in this lecture that I have failed to stress the significance of tradition in safeguarding the Christian faith from error and false teaching. This is a particularly important issue at the present. The Church of England is deeply and bitterly divided. On the one hand, there are those who feel that the Catholic tradition of the Church of England is at risk. On the other hand, there are those who feel that, at all costs, they must maintain its reform of the tradition. Alternative Episcopal oversight has been provided for the first group within the organisation of the Church of England. The other group have set up their own institutional arrangements outside the Church of England, but within the Anglican Communion. A broad church view of this might be as follows. I allowed at the beginning of this lecture that it was important for the early church to maintain a succession of teaching in order to ensure the essential truth of the gospel. However, I am equally clear that the church owes much to people in its history who have been prepared to break with received tradition and to go their own way. Where would the church be with, without St. Francis, or Martin Luther, or George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, or John Wesley. And we must not forget that F. D. Morris himself was dismissed from his post at King's College London in 1853 because of his alleged false theology. The man responsible for his dismissal was a Dr. Jelf, Today, Morris is widely and deeply studied as one of the greatest Anglican thinkers of the 19th century. If Jelf is remembered at all today, it is as the person who was responsible for Morris's dismissal. It seems to me that we must do two things. First, we must believe and trust in the Holy Spirit. We must believe and trust that if we do our work honestly and prayerfully, God's Spirit will overrule what is bad in our work and will use what is good in the furtherance of his kingdom. Second, we must believe in the Gamaliel principle. In Acts chapter 5, when the apostles are brought before the Jewish council and reminded that they had been strictly charged not to preach about Jesus, a member of the council named Gamaliel warned his colleagues not to be too hasty. He reviewed the recent history of his people and how several revolutionary movements had come to nothing. He concluded with the words, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Acts 5, 38 to 39. As a lawyer might say, here I rest my case. <laughs>